Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. What's up, Lance? Well, I am very excited about this interview that we have coming up with a wonderful first time writer who tackles this incredible story about a particular day, January 7th, 1994, in a small town in our neck of the woods. And she does a fantastic job. But before we get to that, it's a new year. Is it a new year, a new you? Or do you do that? Do you do like new year, new me? With, uh, Not really. With, with new year resolutions and... Nope. Same old Tim. I'm doing fine over here. Excited to uh, introduce our, uh, our new friend, Marjorie Metzger. She is, as you noted, a first-time author, and she wrote this book called Hidden Demons that was released on January 3rd, 2023, so just happened, and it is about serial killer Lewis Lent and so much more, Lance. Yeah, and Marjorie is a really amazing woman. She's a retired social worker, and her tackling this story is really unique with that point of view. And uh, part of the interview towards the end, of course, we always want to know what our guests are up to, what the next project is. And she tells us she's going to take a little break from writing more true crime, which I thought was really refreshing because usually people say, oh, well, I started digging in on this other one. And she's just at a point in her life where she's like, nope, I got that out of my system. It went well. And we're just going to see what the next thing is that's going to come along. So I just like that attitude about her and she's just a really fun person to talk to. Yes, yeah, she's a, uh, a social worker by trade and uh, mediator as well. So uh, she, I don't think ever really expected to write a true crime book, but um, it's really good. And we highly recommend it. It's from our friends over there at Wild Blue Press. And you can get it on Amazon or uh, the Wild Blue Press site as well. And I just want to mention a couple of the victims here of serial killer Lewis Lent. Jimmy Bernardo, who was 12 years old, and Sarah Ann Wood, who was also 12 years old, were kidnapped and murdered by Lewis Lent, and he had he confessed to those murders, and uh, I believe he is incarcerated for those murders. Um, but there are other ones as well that he is likely connected to that he has not confessed to. So there's still this unknown element with the whole story that Marjorie brings to us in Hidden Demons. And Tim, if people wanted to listen to this interview with Marjorie without any ads, is there some place we can tell her to direct her fans? There is. Yeah, they can go to crawlspace.supportingcast.fm or they can just subscribe now on Apple Podcasts and you can get every single episode of Crawl Space ad free. And you also get our weekly bonus show that we do and we speak about the cases that we cover and some behind the scenes fun here at Crawl Space Media. Some exclusives. And in case Marjorie's friends want to follow us on social media, they can do it by following us at Crawl Space Podcast or Crawl Space Pod. Now, is that just exclusive to her friends or is that pretty much a blanket statement for anyone? That is a blanket statement for anyone. We are available there publicly, yes. And for those who are not subscribed and will hear ads, I think we're going to take a quick break here for a couple and then we'll be back with uh, our new friend Margie. We sure are. So thanks a lot for listening. Hey, give us five stars while you're at it. Welcome to the podcast, author Marjorie Metzger. How are you today? Oh, I'm great. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. You have written an incredible book called Hidden Demons, Evil Visits a Small New England Town. We were privileged enough to get a copy of this from your publishing company, Wild Blue Press. And this is your first book. And we'll get into that, but congratulations on it being your first book and being such a solid account of a very interesting, fascinating, uh, bizarre occurrence in in central massachusetts but anyway thank you for joining us we really appreciate it good well you know it, it was exciting to write this and i had notes from it for years you know i retired and decided that this is a story that just i, I wanted to, to write about and the way i found out about this story is i happened to be friendly with the 
father and daughter, the police officer and his daughter, who happened to nab criminals on the same day. And I thought it was really fascinating that a father and daughter did this on the same day. And I just wrote a little note about it years ago and just put it aside. I figured, oh, you know, maybe I'll write a little blurb about it. But then after I retired, I said, you know, I think this is a book. So I went to the police officer and said, you know, what do you think? Can I write it? And first his wife said, no, he's a very private person. I don't think he'll want you to do this. But when I spoke to him, he said, fine, go ahead. So I had to go ahead and then I had to do it. I mean, I got the permission and then, you know, you can't not do it. You said that you are retired. You decided to write this when you were retired. So that brings me to my next question before we get into the book, which is you have a fascinating career path. Can you uh, tell the listeners a little bit about what brought you to this point and the different types of careers that you've uh, accomplished? Yeah, I'm a social worker by training. I have a master's and an ACSW in social work. And I had done various kinds. I had done uh, child protective services. I had done juvenile probation. I had done a psychiatric and I have done psychotherapy. But then I decided that, you know, I just wasn't happy doing this and I wanted to do something different. So I completely changed careers and I moved up to the Berkshires to study physical fitness and myotherapy with Bonnie Pruden, who goes way back as a fitness guru years back. She was actually on the Today Show when it was a Dave Garraway show and had encouraged President Eisenhower to start the President's Council on Physical Fitness. So I studied with her for two years and started doing exercise classes all over the area. I taught for the hospital, I taught mothers and babies and pregnant women and elderly and just a lot of different classes. But then, you know, I started volunteering, uh, trying to get Soviet Jews out of the Soviet Union. And uh, when they finally were allowed to come out, our community decided that we were going to take in refugees. And I headed up the program, the Refugee Resettlement Program, which I did for many years. But as I was doing that, I was also getting involved in the Jewish Film Festival in the area. It was our synagogue. It was a fundraiser for the Hebrew school. And my kids went to Hebrew school. So um, I started working with the man who originated it. And he left, left no notes. And I took it over and ended up doing that for 30 years, uh, along with my social work. And then when I finished with resettlement, I decided I really wanted to become a mediator. So I became a mediator and was mediating in court, in district court for criminal and civil cases. And then when I retired from that, I wrote a book. Well, you know what? All of what you just said is so incredible. And the fact that the book you ended up writing, Hidden Demons, goes to show how incredible that story is because you seem to have a bunch of books just in your history that you could possibly write based on your past and the things that you've done and, and again, your accomplishments. So I think that's also a testament to how, again, I, I, I use the word fascinating. I'm overusing the word fascinating. Just how just how riveting this book is. Well, thank you. Um, it, it, it's a good story, but it actually evolved as I was writing it. It started out that I knew the story of the Boyingtons. That was Owen Boyington, who was a detective in the Pittsfield Police Department, and his daughter, Amy, who was a senior in college, would be home on weekends, and she'd work at a local girls' club, and she was a lifeguard. And it just happened on that very day. It was January 7th, 1994. A little girl, a 12-year-old, was walking to school, had her earphones on, just doing her thing. It was a very snowy day. And as she's walking, and this is right in the middle of town, and when I say right in the middle of town, I mean you can't be more in the middle of town. 
It was at the Rotary where North, South, East, and West streets came together. A man comes up to her, points a gun in her ribs, and says, get in the truck. Well, this kid, I don't know how she had the presence of mind to do it, but she faked an asthma attack. Kid never had asthma. Said, can I just sit down for a minute? She just kneeled down just enough that she wiggled out of her backpack and took off running. The man is standing there holding a backpack and he notices that somebody's parked at the light and looking at him. So he gets in his truck and drives off. Well, he ran through two red lights and this guy that saw the whole thing said, you know, this isn't right. So as the girl took off running, she saw a man that was snow blowing and he took her in, the snow blowing the sidewalk. He took her in, they called the police. And at the same time, this man found a policeman and he called in. So they both called in at the same time. So now we have, you know, this attempted kidnapping. And ironically, it was right under the window of the DA's office. So, you know, we have this incident now. So what they did was they called in all the police officers that were not on duty yet to come in and to scour the city to look for this guy. So Owen Boynton was one of the detectives that they called in and he located the guy. And as he located him and he was talking to him, in his mind, he put together something so puzzling that had a, a tragedy that had happened three years before and nobody could figure out. And within minutes, Owen Boynton put together that this guy was not only an attempted kidnapper, but he had murdered a boy three years before and they had no clue as to who had done it. And as this was going on, his daughter was working at the girls club. It was a snowy day, there were only a few kids there. She let the girls go swimming. When they came back, they came back early to change their clothes. When they came down, one of the girls' mothers was there and the girl said, there's a man in the back of the changing room. So of course, Amy goes back and her friend goes back and they're looking and they're pulling back the curtains and they see this guy. He takes off running and Amy runs after him and catches him. I mean, she's kids unafraid. Her father's a police officer. She doesn't think twice. Her father says, if you see something, say something or do something. Without thinking, she takes off and, and grab, nabs this guy. She drags him back to the girls' club. They lock him in the office. She's trying to call her father to tell him what happened. Can't understand why he can't answer the phone and why she can't get through. Because this is the biggest case that the Pittsfield Police Department had. So both of them have this going on at the same time. So that's where the book started. And the way it plays out is like the scenes from a scary movie, from like a, a thriller, a psychological thriller, where the bad guys lurking in the closet or behind the clothes on the on the clothesline, you know, and the you're whipping open the clothes or whatever, or the curtain, and there's like these jump scares. So that's how it's building up in your mind as you're reading this, and then you realize this is a true story, and then it's like, why, why are you chasing this person? And then the fact that they actually get this person and, and lock this person in a room, uh, just like an incredible part to that, and this seems like when you're entering into the story, something really odd is happening to this town in one day. And is there something more to to, to this story that is lurking beneath the surface? So uh, it's a hook. It's definitely a hook that gets you, gets you in. Yeah. And um, at that time, I was unaware of, well, it was not until I started interviewing people and spoke to the district attorney, who at the time when this was happening was the assistant district attorney, found out that that was the day that the trial was starting for Wayne Lowe. I didn't realize that that all went on at the same time. I knew about Wayne Lowe, but I, that had never entered my mind as being a part of the book until I realized 
that these two enormous things were happening, three enormous things were happening at the same time. And let me back up and tell you a little bit about Wayne Lowe. Wayne Lowe was a student at Simons Rock College in Great Barrington, Mass. And Simons Rock College is a school that takes in very, very bright, talented students who are young. They're either juniors or sophomores or juniors in high school, and they're better served in a college environment than in high school. And Wayne Lowe won a scholarship. He was very smart. He was very talented. He was a violinist and very brilliant student. He goes out one day, buys a gun, and shoots up the campus. I mean, this is just way before this was happening. I mean, it happened in Texas, at University of Texas before that. But this was not an unusual, this was a very unusual occurrence. So the day that this was happening, that they nabbed this guy for attempting to kidnap this girl and possibly the murder of this boy. The biggest case they had up to this point was Wayne Lowe and that was starting tr trial the same day. So all these things converged on that Friday in January, 1994. How wild. Um, and, and how was it that Detective Owen Boyington kind of put it together in his head that this attempted kidnapper could also be the murderer of uh, Jimmy Bernardo? Well, he asked the right questions. When he spoke to the guy, he said, um, where do you work? And the guy said, well, I used to work at the cinema center, but I don't work there anymore. That was first clue. And the second thing was, he says, you know, I know a lot of people around here, but you don't look familiar to me. Where are you from? And he told him where he was from in upstate New York. And that was where Jimmy Bernardo's body was found, 200, over 200 miles away from where he was taken in Pittsfield. And it just, a light bulb just went off in his head at that moment. He said, the kid disappeared from the cinema center and he was found in upstate New York. Bingo. This must be the guy. And it just clicked for him. Yeah. Yeah, some great uh, detective instinct there, I think, mixed with, uh, I guess, some common sense, but also like a profile of some, a, a child killer, essentially, that's that was not right in front of him. Well, you know, this is not the kind of thing that a community here would even think of anybody as being a child killer. I mean, this was kind of, I would say, a nebbishy guy who was very helpful to a lot of people. And uh, he was a kind of guy that in some ways was a little creepy. But, you know, just because somebody's a little creepy, you don't think that they were a murderer. I mean, it just, that's not in people's thinking. Um, so, you know, he just seemed to... Um, slip under the radar for a very long time. Yeah. And um, can you tell us about how Jimmy Bernardo uh, went missing? Yes. He was, he often would go to the Pittsfield Plaza. And at the Pittsfield Plaza was a, a laundromat. There was uh, pinball machines in there. The kids would hang out. They'd ride their bikes all the big parking lot. They'd ride their bikes. There was a movie theater. There were a bunch of things. So the kids, you know, they just go hang out. And this was after dinner one night. He's hanging out, riding his bike. And he goes over, he's by the cinema center. And this man, Louis Lent, who worked as a janitor at the cinema center, saw this kid and just saw opportunity. I mean, it was just, that's what, uh, serial killers look for. They look for opportunity. They look for vulnerability and they look for opportunity. And uh, he just saw that and said to the kid, well, how would you like to make $5 come in and help me move some chairs in the cinema center? Kid said, great. He went in. That was, that was it. 
you know. Len had his uh, kidnap uh, bag. He said, just wait here, I gotta go to my car. He had everything ready. I mean, it, he was used to doing this. And that was just it. Yeah. So it's a, I mean, he's kind of created that opportunity to some degree for himself. Um, it's just terrifying to me to think about how many killers there are out there that haven't killed yet, that they're just waiting for the, uh, the opportunity to, uh, for that to happen. It's crazy to me. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because it seems like this is a full-time job for some of these people. I mean, this is what they're always looking out for a victim. And, you know, they'll go, I mean, they, they it's amazing what Lewis lent, what they found that he had um, his planning for all this was just so frightening and so intense. I mean, this is like a full-time job. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. Lewis lent confessed to Jimmy Bernardo's murder. How how did that go? How did the um, interrogation go? And uh, yeah, interviews with police and uh, Lewis Lent. Well, once they had him at the police station, that you know he didn't realize that they were on to him, but they they knew it. And of course, they contacted the police in New York State because this was a case that they had been working on for three years. Also, because Jimmy was found murdered in New York State, so. At first, it was just their tactic was make them comfortable and get them talking. You know, don't grill them. Just let them talk himself into a corner. And at first, it was just, you know, casual talking. But then they were catching him on some lies. And things just got to the point where, you know, he really kind of knew that he was in trouble. And he was constantly figuring out how he could manipulate and get around things so that, you know, he wouldn't tell the truth. Well, at first he didn't. He told a lot of lies and they caught him in some of them, you know, little things. And finally, I, I don't know what it was, but the next day, the police officers were just nice enough to him and got him comfortable enough that he started talking. And once he started talking, I think their mouths dropped open with some of the things that he was telling them. I'm going to set up a nice cliffhanger here, right? With what you said, because I want to engage the listeners in the geographic location where this took place. Can you describe what this area is like to yes. sort of paint that picture for people? And then we can get into a little bit more into uh, Lewis Lent. Okay. Uh, we're in the very westernmost part of Massachusetts, uh, probably right out to the border of New York State. And it is so beautiful here. There are ski areas, there are parks, there are lakes. Uh, there's so much cultural things. There's Tanglewood, the Boston Symphony Orchestra summer home. There's Shakespeare and Company. There's theater, there's dance, there's everything. It's a very big tourist mecca in the summer and um, a good ski area in the winter. Uh, and it, beautiful leaf peeper, you know, beautiful autumn, a lot of leaf peepers come up. So it's a very lovely area and very family oriented quiet town, not a whole lot of nightlife going on here. People always felt very comfortable here and very safe up to this point. Yeah. And that all changed pretty quickly. Can you tell us what happened after Lewis confessed to uh, Jimmy's murder? Well, he had to be arraigned in court and they had him in custody. And as soon as he was in custody after that weekend, uh, he had lawyers assigned to him, and then he, he couldn't talk to anybody anymore. I mean, that was it. 
and then it was in the lawyer's hands. And I have to say that the lawyers that defended him did an incredible job considering what they had to work with because the evidence was so strong against him that um, they they really gave gave their all to defend this guy. And in their defense of him, what were some of the main, I guess, defense points that they were using? Well, they really were, the only thing they could get do was technicalities. I mean, the facts were the facts, but the only recourse they had was to find things that were done wrong, that they could catch him on a technicality and have the case thrown out. And that just didn't happen. And I really don't want to get into specifics because I don't want to give everything away. Yeah, but, that's understandable. Um, you know, the, totally. they, they really dug deep <laughs> to find yeah. things. Yeah, they did. And it seems like Lent could be responsible for more murders as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, it's still an open case. And this is uh, 29 years later. There is a group of people who are still working on this case. And as a matter of fact, they would not talk to me. And they told several people not to talk to me. I'm not sure why, but that's fine. You know, they have their reasons. Uh, I think it's an open case. My guess, well, I know one reason it's an open case because they're still looking for bodies that he won't tell them what he's done with them. But I suspect, but I don't know for sure, that there might be other murders that they're tracking down that I don't know about and the public does not know about. Can you tell us a little bit about the information that he has given to investigators? What I can tell you is that he's very cagey. When he feels that things might disrupt his equilibrium and he might feel uncomfortable with something, he's willing to give up just a little bit. So he's been doing this for years. You know, whenever his life gets a little messy, he, he'll talk a little bit. But he always has that reserve in him, his bargaining chip, that he will not give up. And um, how old is he now? He's still uh, he's still incarcerated? Oh, he'll, he can't get out. Yeah. His um, sentencing was life in prison with no chance of parole. That's why he was tried in Massachusetts. Because had he been tried in New York, he would have had the possibility of parole. And at the time, Gerard Downing, who was the district attorney, said, no, we got to get this guy forever. He's too dangerous to be out. Yeah. Did you consider speaking with him for the book? Yes. I wrote to him three times. Didn't answer the first two letters. Third letter. Oh, it's funny. The first... Uh, I, I didn't know how to approach it, but I wrote him. The second letter I wrote him, I was talking to Frank Pace, who was a state trooper from New York, who was uh, big in the task force. He was a major player in the task force. Um, he said to me, if you wrote me that letter, I wouldn't answer you either. So I did it wrong. The third letter, I tried a different tact, and he did answer me. And with this, I was a little snippy. But he didn't say anything. But about a couple of days later, I get a phone call from a man in Vermont who said he was a friend of, of Louis Lentz. And Lou wanted him to check up on me and find out about me. And I said, no way. You're not going to find out about me. I was just wanting to talk to Louis to see if I could get a more balanced take on my story. Anyway. This guy said, oh, I know all about him. I said, well, are you willing to talk to me? He said, we'll I'll have to talk to Lou and see if he'll let me talk to you. Well, the guy got, gets back to me and says, Lou wants to know if you want to know where he buried the bodies. And I said, no, I'm not a police officer. That's not why I'm trying to contact him. But I think that, um, you know, this is it. I, th I think that we we shouldn't talk anymore. And that was the end of that. It actually made me very nervous. So I, I put an end to that. You know, I knew I knew that if I talked to Lou or wrote to him, Louis Lent, that I wouldn't get a straight answer anyway. But I just kind of wanted 
really wanted to see this guy. I mean, just out of curiosity in person, but that didn't happen. I can see how that could make you nervous. And also, did it make you annoyed? I feel like that's annoying to have a convicted serial child killer want to check up on you. Like, that's just rude. No, I wasn't annoyed. Uh, I wasn't annoyed. I, I was a little I was a little nervous about it. Um, but then I figured, what can we do? I mean, he's behind bars forever. <laughs> you know, I don't I don't think he's got a network of cronies that are gonna come after me. It was just kind of a little unsettling, but no, I wasn't annoyed. Mm-mm. Yeah. Well, I'm a little annoyed. Um, no, just kidding. Um, well, I, I don't know. I mean, he's got people li- listening to him, I guess, take still kind of taking orders from him all these years later uh, while he's still in prison. I, you know, I think your nervousness was absolutely justified um, there. Well, I don't know if um, I don't understand why this guy was friendly with him. I, I was trying to get a handle on that. And I tried to ask him, well, how do you know him? you know, this and that, but I didn't get anything from him. You know, he was cagey too. So, but I know that all the people around here that he knew were just so disgusted by this whole thing and so appalled by it and horrified that I'm sure that nobody here has anything, has had anything to do with him after that. What's your thoughts on him having accomplices during his reign of child killings? I don't think he did. I think this is just his his own thing. I mean, I can't say for sure. Uh, the people that are still working on the case probably know a whole lot more about this than I do. But I think it was just his own thing. And, you know, he just, you know, had these sexual urges and, you know, he just couldn't control them. And they were escalating and getting more and more dire and urgent. Yeah. Yeah. We, we were um, shocked to learn recently when we spoke to a, a different author who um, does some research into murder data and found that um, 30 to 40 percent of serial killers have an accomplice at some point during their at least one of their murders, um, whether that's luring a victim or helping uh, disposal. Uh, it's, it was actually really kind of a shocking number uh, to us. See, I I didn't know that. And I, I, this is new to me. And the only thing I could think of if he did, which I don't know that he did, and I never heard that he did, would be disposal of the body. But I think he was just too into himself to have an accomplice with this. I mean, he just didn't relate well enough to anybody, I don't think, to to have an accomplice. I think it was, you know, I think it's, a thrill and a shame at the same time. I mean, they know it's wrong, but they don't care. And I don't know how how wrong they think it is. You know, I think sometimes they think they've been wronged when it didn't work out the way they wanted it. I, I can't get into a brain like that because my brain doesn't work like that. And most people's brain does not work like that. And, yeah. You know, I, I can't get into that. Well, luckily, you're on a podcast, and when you're on a podcast, you can speculate about uh, what someone's <laughs> mind space is like. <laughs> you're an expert. <laughs> and we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors, and now we're back to the program. And can you tell us about Sarah Ann Wood? Yeah, this poor little girl. Oh, she was, it was in the summertime. She was on her bike and she had some kind of poster. She was trying to hold all this together, riding her bike. And then the chain came off her bike, which is something that the public did not know. And only the killer knew about that. So she's walking her bike up a hill. He's cruising around looking for a victim, which he often did. He sees this girl. She was perfect, you know. She turned him on. He was getting aroused. She was vulnerable. He thought it was easy prey. And he just pulled up alongside of her, grabbed her, threw her in his van, and basically that was it. Took her bike, threw it off to the side of the road, kicked her papers off, and took off with her. 
I mean, the kid didn't stand a chance um, because she was in the middle of nowhere and she couldn't yell. She took off running, but he, he, he got her right away. Um, the kid really did not stand a chance. I mean, it was a perfect opportunity for him because she she checked all the boxes. And that's and that sort of thing doesn't happen randomly. I mean, he doesn't find the perfect victim randomly. He's not driving to McDonald's and then he's like, oh, there there's the perfect victim. It's creepy, terrifying to think about how many people then and today and are driving around looking for this. You know, it, there's so many places that a predator can cruise by just on the way to the store every single day and make mental notes about when certain people, when kids are getting off the bus, walking home. Okay, I saw that one, at you know, in this proximity to this house on this day. So it's just creepy to think that that's going through his head and he sees her and she has no idea. And then that's when he strikes. Well, I think it was more than mental notes. I think that he also took notes and he had things I mean, he had schedules of kids and stuff, but he would just spend hours driving around looking for perfect victims. And, you know, he had his bag of tricks and he had things worked out. And it was interesting when I spoke to police chief Gerald Lee, who was police chief at Pittsfield at the time, he said they had an FBI profiler come and the FBI profiler explained to them how serial killers work. And he said one thing that he didn't realize that was very helpful is that how a serial killer improves his bag of tricks as time goes on and his techniques. For example, if they have rope that they're going to tie up their victims, rather than having to cut it while they're there, they eventually figure out, oh, we'll cut pieces so they'll be just ready. And every time he just improve a little bit in his bag that he carried with him, with his um, his kit, his kidnapping kit. So uh, Cap, um, Captain Lee said that, or Chief Lee said that, um, you know, it was very helpful that the profiler explained that to him. I wanted to speak to an FBI profiler but I, I could not get anybody to speak to me. I would have liked to have really understood more how they profiled Lewis Lynn, but that I didn't get. Yeah, I always find that fascinating as well. W what do you know about him or his upbringing? Um, w what went wrong uh, in, in his life? Well, I think part of it was that there were just a lot of kids a lot of chaos in the family. I think there was a lot of brutality in the family that nobody admitted until after he's arrested. I think there was sexual abuse. I think there was maybe physical abuse. And I think that, you know, sometimes kids just get ignored. You know, there are just so many kids and nobody has time for them. And they don't get what they need early on. I mean, that's all I can guess. I mean, you can also say, well, maybe he inherited uh, this type of personality from his father. Or maybe he um, hit his head and had something wrong, you know, with him. You know, who knows? But I think there was enough stuff in the family in terms of just abuse and neglect and chaos that um, something along the way early on because this personality disorder happens very early on. Uh, it's in early developmental stages and apparently something just was missing early on. I want to circle back briefly to Jimmy Bernardo. What kind of boy was he? You know, it's interesting that you ask that. And I did not talk to his parents because I knew it would be too upsetting. And there was a tightrope with my writing this because there's a lot of brutality in here. 
but I didn't want to dredge up things that were so painful years ago. I had to be very, very careful. And as it turns out, which I found out down the road, is that Jimmy's parents live on my block down the road, down the street from me. They weren't living here then when Jimmy, when this happened to Jimmy. Uh, they stayed to themselves, so I didn't know who they were. And then I would see his father as I was writing this book, and I just couldn't tell him. I couldn't bring myself to tell him until I finished the book and before I gave it to anybody to look at, I saw him and I said, I'd like to sit down with you and your wife to tell you about the book that I'm writing. And he said, this happened 30 years ago. We can't talk about it. And we really don't want to have anything to do with it. You can do what you want, but we can't deal with this. So, you know, I respected that, but I had to tell them. I mean, I couldn't let this book go out without their knowing that I had written it. And I was really nervous about talking to them about it, but, you know, had to do it. It's tough to form an opinion about that decision that they made. You know, like one part of me thinks it's healthier to talk about these things and make sure that all of the feelings, no matter how long it's been, get communicated, especially to, you know, your wife or your husband. Uh, and then if someone wants to write the book, I would think, yeah, I would love to see how this person paints this picture of my son and the occurrence, the events that happened and even, you know, the community. I That's where I first go. And then the, the other part of me is like, well, if you've gotten by this long without this happening and you're doing okay, why drudge it up again? Uh, you know, I, you know? I, I cannot imagine what it's like for parents to go through this. My children, my older daughter was, uh, I think, a year or two younger than Jimmy. I have two children. I don't know how I could have lived through it. I really don't. And I don't know how the Bernardos made it through. And you find with a lot of people who have had this tragedy that their family falls apart and the Bernardo family has not fallen apart. So whatever they've done to maintain their sanity and their, and go on with their lives, I just admire them in every way for being able to do that and to live through this because I don't know how I could have lived through that happening in my family. Yeah, I'm with you there. Um, what about Rebecca Savarisi, who was the, I think, 12-year-old girl who was mm -hmm. nearly abducted uh, by Lent uh, back in the early 90s? Did you speak with her for your book? No, uh, she wouldn't speak with me. My daughter is Facebook friends with her and, and contacted her, and she says, no, I, I don't want to have anything to do with this. Uh, Rebecca, even from the beginning, did not want publicity. Uh, she's a strong kid, an amazing, amazing girl. And, you know, she did have, I mean, everybody wanted to talk to her. Everybody wanted to interview her. She was on te national television. She got a citation from the governor. She, you know, she, everybody wanted a piece of Rebecca. And uh, Paul Paracci was named a uh, guardian, a guardian for her to get her through this, uh, to shepherd her through all these interviews and everything. Uh, Paul Paracci eventually became juvenile court judge. He was very good with kids. Um, and he said that she just had no interest in the publicity and she just wanted to put it behind her. And uh, so she did not want to talk about it, which I understand. I mean, this was a part of her life that was over and she went on with her life. Yeah, that makes sense, too. Now, you already spoke about one um, kind of crazy coincidence in this case with the Boyntons, um, father and daughter, uh, both capturing a, a criminal um, on the same day. Can you tell us about the coincidence that you wrote about with witness Russell Davis? Yeah, Russell Davis was coming home from work. He had had 
worked a night shift and he was stopped at the light when all this happened. Uh, he happened to forget to take his glasses off so he could see pretty clearly what was going on. So, you know, he witnessed this and he knew something was wrong. As it turns out, Russell Davis's wife and Mary Bernardo, Jimmy's mother, went to school together and were good friends. So Russell's wife, you know, and would go over to Mary's house. And just before this happened, she asked Mary, said, is anything new with the Jimmy case? And she said, no, nothing's new. And ironically, it turns out that her husband was the one that saw the guy who ended up being the killer of Jimmy Bernardo. So they had that that family connection. Yeah, that's a pretty wild um, coincidence. It, uh, you know, it's also a very small area. So I'd, maybe that's one reason those coincidences happen. But also uh, seems like just something something about that time in that area, um, you know. Well, y- you, you said it exactly right. This is a small area and a lot of people know everybody else. So um, and if you grew up here, which I did not. I mean, I've lived here for 43 years, but I did not grow up here. I came here as an adult. Um, people that grew up here, they um, keep in touch. They they know what's going on, you know. So it's not that. I, I guess it's it's coincidental. It definitely is coincidental. But you have a small town where people grew up together. Probably you know went to school together. Had the goods on everybody, you know. Oh, I knew you back when question that's going to go back to something that you mentioned earlier. You said that you were speaking with or there's a group of people investigating this case still. Were you saying that these people are investigators like law enforcement or private investigators and they don't talk to you? They're they're most retired law enforcement. Ah, retired law enforcement. it's, It's like, I guess it's cold case stuff but they're still working on it. But they were a group of people that were, and they conferred with the FBI. I don't know if they still do. And they were um, from New York, from Massachusetts. I would imagine retired state troopers and police officers about, from both states. And you know, that it's interesting. There is, um, Lewis Lent finally admitted that he killed uh, Jamie Lucier, that was in the Westfield. And that was not until 2013. And that was only when um, people from Florida came up and were asking the people from Westfield, you know, they knew about this and they think that there was something else going on in Florida. They had something that they believed was attached to Lewis Lent. I don't know what it was. I wasn't privy to that. So I think that things are still cropping up around the country. And who knows where, you know, where else he was, where he, you know, was prowling. You know, with his life sentence, do you think that he has any chance to use some of these, I don't know, locations of the hidden bodies as I mean, does he have any leverage here to reduce his sentence, or is that pretty much set? No, he won't. He won't reduce his sentence. But let's say, for example, he's very comfortable where he is now because he's in. Uh, he's not in maximum security. He's with a group of um, sexually dangerous predators in their section. So if he's with a group of his own kind, he's not a target. You know, when you're in the general population and you're a child killer, you got a bullseye on your back. They're all out to get you. But he's in a pretty safe um, location now where he's with people that have committed the same type of crimes. They're sexually dangerous predators, whether they kill children or adults or whatever. So he feels really safe and comfortable uh, where he is. Now, for example, if they want to move him somewhere else and he gets nervous that this is not going to be a safe placement or something happens, I'm sure he will 
let out a little bit of information to save his hide, to do anything. I mean, he's not going to get out, but I think that he would do it just to be safer behind bars. Very religious. He he and Jesus are pals. He really thinks that he's he's in good stead because he's he's so religious. So, you know, he reads the Bible and that's his, you know. So he thinks all is forgiven, I think. I don't know. I, I, that is I don't. so an, that's so annoying to me when you hear that somebody who murders children. You just become one, you know, you have a, you develop your relationship with Jesus and that's now in the past. Come on. <laughs> it's so annoying. Well, you know, you're also dealing with somebody who does not think the way we do. And it's really hard to get into the head of somebody who just has no moral compass. Do you think he's responsible for others too? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whatever happened to Nick Mangiardi? Well, um, a year after he was tried for the incident at the girls' club, he attempted to rape a girl. So he had escalated. I mean, besides, you know, just um, not touching people and then going to rape. So he had escalated and he was imprisoned. Um, I found that he was listed, you know, he's on the, um, what do you call it? The list of, of um, sex offenders, sex offenders. Yeah. Yeah. But I couldn't find anything, anything about where he is now or what's happened. So I didn't see anything. And it was very hard actually to find anything in the records in the court of what happened to him. Uh, I found a little bit, but there was not much. So I really don't know. What happened to him? Well, Marjorie, this has been a uh, fantastic conversation here, uh, telling us about your new book, Hidden Demons. It comes out on January 3rd, 2023. Big congrats from us for the book. I think it's great. And um, definitely let us know if you're writing any other books or looking into other crimes. We'd love to have you back on. Thank you. And uh, it can be ordered from Amazon. And then it will come out in hardback, paperback, ebook, and audio. And did you choose January as a anniversary month because this took place? It just it just no, happened. No, but, but it, it is an appropriate time, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Mm-hmm. But fantastic. Do you have anything else in mind that you're going to write about? Are you going to stay on the true crime genre path? Uh, I'm taking a break. <laughs> this is, you know, yeah. I, I can't do anything for a while. This this is dramming. It, it took a lot to do this. So I want to see this through. And then if anything comes along that I think of, you know, I will think about it later. But, you know, I'm the kind of person that if I have too many things going on in my head at once, I, I get all jumbled. So I'm good with just this for now. <laughs>